Okay. Uh, give me a moment. Okay. Should we do the Shema like we did before, do you think, or would that be alright? I don't know if you want to film that or not, but it doesn't matter. Alright. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. If everyone would please stand. And uh, since so many people asked me about why we were facing south last night instead of east, it was because that was the only place that we could see stuff. I wanted to show Father Yah's creation. But you can either stand here or you can face east, which I guess would be this, this way. way. Right? So when we face east, I'm going to do the Shema prayer, Deuteronomy 6 4, in both Hebrew and yes, and English too. So here we go. Shema Israel, Yahweh. that I probably should have gotten into last night about three interrelated names, okay? The first of these names is, of course, Yahweh. That's the name of the Creator. Now, Yahweh is from the Hebrew verb Hayah, which is to be, to exist. And Yahweh literally means Yah, He, Who Is, okay? Because the one thing we can know for certain about our Creator is that He exists. So, the short form of that name, which is, it, it's, it's the same as saying Dave and David, Will and William. The short form of Yahweh is Yah. That's why David keeps going, Hallelujah. Praise you, not the Lord. Praise you, Yah. Okay? Now, the name of the Son, which we're also going to get into in the second part of this teaching, is Yeshua, or, or, or Yeshua. You pronounce it either way, and that means Yahweh saves, or Yahweh is salvation. So it's very important to understand that the Son 
His name points back to his father as his salvation and as our salvation. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear before we get into this teaching. Now, I've never been one to, to uh, try to bury the lead too much. So here's the name of the father and we skip kind of to the conclusion which is, there it is, Yahweh is his name. And this is the first time that I'm doing this updated special edition. First time in four years I've updated this teaching. And I'm doing it for the first time for all of you tonight. Okay? For Sukkot, for Yahweh Sukkot. Hallelujah. All right? Because these are not Jewish feasts. These are not Hebrew Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. I can't hear you. Shabbat Shalom. All right, this is a feast, it's a party. Hallelujah. It's when Father Yah comes down to party with us at Sukkot. Hallelujah. So we need to enjoy every minute of this, folks, yeah. because we wait all year for right now. Hallelujah. All right? Hallelujah. So with that in mind, we're going to get to what I hope will be a, a revealing and helpful teaching to all of you. Okay? I'm Andrew Gabriel Roth, and I'm the founder and president of One Faith, One People Ministries, as you can see on this slide there. And we teach the Torah, the Prophets, the Haftorah, and the Renewed Covenant readings every week, and do special feast teachings, and we travel also, obviously. So here I am, and I'm here with my wife, Jay, who's right there, who helps me with just about everything else. Thank you, honey. All right. Before I get to this teaching, I wanted to explain something that I probably should have gotten into last night about three interrelated names. Okay? The first of these names is, of course, Yahweh. That's the name of the Creator. Now, Yahweh is from the Hebrew verb Hayah, which is to be, to exist. And Yahweh literally means. Yah, he, who is. Okay? Because the one thing we can know for certain about our Creator is that he exists. So, the short form of that name, which is, it, it's, it's the same as saying Dave and David, Will and William. The short form of Yahweh is Yah. That's why David keeps going, Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise you, not the Lord. Praise you, Yah. Okay? Now, the name of the Son, which we're also going to get into in the second part of this teaching, is Yeshua, or, or, or Yeshua. You pronounce it either way. And that means Yahweh saves, or Yahweh is salvation. So it's very important to understand that the Son his name points back to his father as his salvation and as our salvation. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear before we get into this teaching. Now, I've never been one to, to uh, try to bury the lead too much. So here's the name of the father and we skip kind of to the conclusion which is, there it is, Yahweh is his name. And this is the first time that I'm doing this updated special edition. First time in four years I've updated this teaching. And I'm doing it for the first time for all of you tonight. Okay? For Sukkot, for Yahweh Sukkot. Hallelujah. All right? Because these are not Jewish feasts. These are not Hebrew about. Because if we do, the conclusion of the, what I'm going to show you is inescapable. When Paul requested that he might open his mouth, when Paul requested that he might open his mouth and speak, Gallio said to the Jews, if your accusation, O Jews, is related to any legal offense done, or any fraud, or base act, I would listen to you in proper fashion. So, not about Roman law, I don't care basically. But if the discussions are concerning, and here it is, 
Are they concerning words and about names? And with respect to your Torah, there it is again, you must see to it among yourselves, for I am not disposed to be a judge of such matters that he expelled them from the judgment seat. He threw out their case. So what's the one word or name in the Torah that would get the Jews together to try to get the Romans to kill Paul? What's the one name that would get them so fired up that they would want to just take him out then and there? Thank you. Other renewed covenant writers also venerated and taught the name. Peter does in Acts 2 verse 38. James does in 5 verse 10 says, talking about the prophets of old who spoke in the name of Yahweh. 1 Yohanan chapter 3 verses 22 through 24 is all about the name. Just take a look. So this is where I had originally planned for, for part two. But because we're doing this in two rather than three slices, I'm going to continue for a bit. But what's coming up right now is probably one of my top favorite places in this entire presentation. We kind of had to go through this history and lay this foundation slowly to get to earn the right for this next little piece. We're going to talk about proof of the name that came straight out of the ground from archaeologists, okay? And our first stop will prove that even among the pagan nations, as early as 2000 BC, they were remembering the name of a foreign deity of the Semitic people who had just come back from a what after being out for a while. And these people wrote down that name in vowels. So there is no doubt about this. This is what I call the sands cry out. Let's see why. I want to talk about two great scholars who were instrumental in deciphering an ancient language called cuneiform. Their names are Friedrich Delich and Archibald Sacy. Delich is German, Sacy is British. This is what Friedrich Delich says about the language that he spent 30 years learning. He says, the cuneiform writes its vowels in full, even marking their length in many cases. So what happens if they have the name of the Hebrew God? They're going to show the vowels and the lengths of the vowels might be important. One of the challenges though, well people go, why do we get into the scripture? We will. But one of the issues is, is that our current traditional Hebrew text, which was only finalized in about 1000 AD, comes down to us from a group of scribes who are in the business of hiding the name. So for those people who say, well, I read the Hebrew, and it says Yehovah, why would a group of scribes whose job it is to ban the name tell you how to say it? Okay? We're going to get into a lot of that. I did tell you that, didn't I, sir? Yes, I did. Okay. They literally believe this would send them to hell. So I don't think they're going to say, hey, by the way, just, just between 100,000 of you and me, the name really is. I don't think so. That's why for quite a few of the lines of evidence, I have to show sources that reveal the pronunciation before the ban came up to hide it. And thank Yahweh, we've got quite a few of those sources. Recalling Genesis 4, verse 26, at that time men began to call upon the name of Yahweh. These tablets will show that to be literally, historically, factual, and true. 
from 2000 BC. This is before Abraham, folks. That's how far back this goes. This is how it all began. In the 1890s, cuneiform tablets by the hundreds of thousands, they found an ancient library in a place called Nippur. They were brought, well, they went all over the world, but most of them ended up in the British Museum. They were studied by these leading seriologists, the same two guys up here, Archibald Henry Sacy and Friedrich Delich. And they said, so this is not my opinion, they said the text could reveal three occurrences of the name of Yahweh in them. Friedrich Delich explains his version of the discovery in a book he wrote in 1902, Babylon Bible, page 71 through 72. I'm going to show you the actual images from that book. These are the three tablets that we're talking about. Now let me just show you the headline, literally. Here's what's in them. This is showing the vowels, Yahweh, away, Elu. Yahweh is God. That's another, so there's a long form, Yahweh, and there's a short form, Yahweh. And even today, we might say Yahweh, or we might say Yahweh. And both are perfectly fine. And he just says it. The names are, these two names are, Yahweh is God. This is one of the greatest Assyriologists who have ever lived. His words. But I'm not done. The other expert, Delich, says, therefore Yahweh the existing, the enduring one, we have reasons for saying the name may mean this, the one devoid of all change, not like us men who tomorrow are but a thing of yesterday, but one who above the starry vault, which shines with everlasting regularity, lives and works from generation to generation. This, Yahweh, was the spiritual possession of those same nomad tribes out of which after a thousand years the children of Israel were to emerge. It, could this be any clearer? He is saying directly, what I saw on those cuneiform tablets was not a native cuneiform word. It was a foreign word of a foreign people who worshiped a God named Yahweh. Again, 4,000 years old. The other great expert, Archibald Stacy, his find, which he talked about a lot, and got excerpted by many scholarly journals around the same time, can be summarized this way. I'll say in advance, what I'm about to quote had a lot of cuneiform grammar stuff in it. I could have kept it in there, but by the time I explained it, it would be It'd be like a half an hour, okay? So I would just as soon skip to the headline of what the experts said it was so that you can see their conclusions. I mean, if, if you want me to talk to your neighbor, I'm, I'm happy to do it for, for 40 minutes at a stretch because I love ancient cuneiform, but it might not be the best thing for you. So... It is obvious to imagine that we have a name compounded of Yahweh. This was the Assyrian writing of Yahweh, and we may interpret the name Yahweh is God. Two witnesses. Here's the other expert going back to Delich. Yahweh, it must be resolutely upheld that the two personal names, Yahweh Elu and Yahweh Elu, the reading of Yahweh is the only possible one in the question. He doesn't seem to be backing down too much on this point, does he? Yahweh. Now, 
I will explain that modern Hebrew will say that vuk, a V for the sixth letter. Every dialect of ancient Hebrew, before they can compile the Mishnah, and every dialect of Aramaic, which is its sister language, says the sixth letter is a W. So it is actually Yahweh. Or, or, and the, then the Ya becomes compressed as Yahweh. Okay? Because that's how you would say Yah in cuneiform. Like I said, I could get technical on that and very precise, but it might not be so helpful for all of you guys. Moving on to Yah and Yahweh. The ancient evidence for Yahweh is decisive, I believe, and compelling. So we just saw how Yahweh is preserved in cuneiform texts. We've seen the scripture actually uphold and preserve, not ban, the short form of the name. How do we see that? When did we see that? When we talked about hallelujah. They never banned the Yah in hallelujah. And there are places where we're about to see that Yah and Yahweh are the same name. Again, like Dave and David, same name. How do we know? Here's how. We look at the scripture. Right? We need to look at the fact that Yah is in the scripture as his one and only name. Right here, starting here. Yah is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my Elohim, and I will praise him. My father's Elohim, and I will extol him. Doesn't hurt that that comes out of Moshe's own mouth, does it? Exodus 15, 1 through 2. Yah has sworn, and Yahweh will have war. We know there's not two gods, right? Yah has sworn, and Yahweh will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Gee, also from the book of Exodus. How about this one? Sing to Elohim, sing praises to his name. Lift up a song for him who rides through the deserts, whose name is Yah. And exult before him. And the short form of the name, this is the real strength. I've spoken to many people who have different opinions about what the long form is. I have yet to find a single person in those other camps, someone who studied this matter, who disagrees that the short form is Yah. Because it was never banned, the vowels are in the text, we know it is Yah. But how about this one? I shall remember the deeds of Yah. Surely I remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and muse on your deeds. See, El is my deliverance. I trust and I'm not afraid for Yah, Yahweh. There it is, right next to each other. Yah, Yahweh is my strength and my song and he has become my deliverance. And you will draw water with joy from the fountains of deliverance. So it says Isaiah. Again, Isaiah, Jeremiah, no end on the name in their times. Yah is not a separate name, it's simply the simplified form of the one and he's interchangeable with it. Moving on, what about showing an Egyptian reference to those pesky Hebrews and their God from 1400 BC, that's a generation after they left Egypt under Moses. There it is, in Egyptian hieroglyphs. This is what we call a captive relief. To see this captive, he's holding a shield with the name of the, of the nation, as if to say, I'm captive, I'm from here, and Pharaoh rules over me. They are called the Shasu, which is the Egyptian word for foreigners, of Yahweh's land. There it is, 
And take a look at this guy before I show this reference coming up. Doesn't he kind of look Semitic? Can you see that nose? Can you see his hair? And that angular beard? I went to Hebrew school with a dude like this. Okay? Now this comes from the most, one of the most respected Egyptologists in the world. A man who's been in Egyptology for 50 years. His name is Donald Redford of the University of Pennsylvania. And by the way, he's not a believer. Okay? This is what Donald Redford said about this inscription. I think we can take his word for it. He says, For half a century, it has been generally admitted that we have here the Tetragrammaton, the name of the Israelite God, Yahweh. And if this be the case, as it undoubtedly is, this passage constitutes the most precious indication of the whereabouts during the late 15th century BCE of an enclave revering this God. Late 15th century BCE, that's when Joshua is conquering Canaan. Okay? So this is a perfect match. So if anyone says, well, we don't have any ancient proof of the pronunciation of the name, really? You don't think that the ancient Egyptians picked up the name of the Hebrew God while they had them as slaves? Really? I almost hate to move on from this, because it's just... I'm kind of in suspense wondering what I'm going to say next after that. Right? Now we go to about 840 BC, and this is something that's really amazing to me. You know when your enemies admit something that's inconvenient for them, they're probably telling the truth. So here's a little story for y'all, right? About 19, 18th century, scholars were saying David was a myth. They said there's no evidence for David outside of the Bible. They made him up. They didn't get going until Hezekiah's time and they just invented their version of King Arthur. That's what they used to say. That's what they used to teach our children. I'm, I'm not making this up. So, then they found this thing called the Meshesteli, which mentions the same Israelite kings that the Bible mentions. You may have heard of Ahab, he's mentioned. You may have heard of Omri, He's mentioned, and then it mentions the house of David. 150, within 150 years of David's death, they mentioned the house of David. Why would they make up the house of David if it hadn't existed? What, just to be nice to their enemies that they're trying to, oh, I don't know, kill? Yeah, we want to make it easier for the Hebrews to have faith by celebrating their King David, the House of David. I don't think so. And the same artifact that mentions the House of David, guess what it also says? Yahweh. This, in, in, in Hebrew terms, is the earliest extra-biblical reference this, so that we know that when we're reading about this in Kings and Chronicles, which is the exact time that this is, they are not making it up that this is the name of Yahweh. And people go, yes, but Paleo-Hebrew doesn't have vowels. Right, which is why we started with a language that does have vowels, so that when we show you these letters here, we know how to pronounce them, don't we? Moving on. This is what they call the Elephantine Papyrus. A lot of folks don't know that even though the scripture says you should only have one temple to Yahweh and that temple has to be in Jerusalem, guess what? There were not one, but two temples to Yahweh in Egypt, one of which was predicted by the prophet Isaiah. This is the earlier one. The Jews had 
settled into Egypt, and it's a long story how they got their temple built. That's more appropriate for like my two-hour teaching on the Ark of the Covenant, so I can't really get into that. But what I will say is this. They worshipped, they did syncretism. This is why the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they were angry at the Jews who were in Egypt. They said so over and over that they were doing pagan stuff. This proves that they were right. They worshipped Yahweh and not. Okay? And they, and they have documents, including this one, from 408 BCE, that spell out the name of Yahweh. In Hebrew sister language, which I've made a major study in my adult life, the name Yahweh, they took the short form, which was Yah, which is the same name, and they added the Aramaic word for Lord, which is Mar. Mar Yah. And they, there is an Aramaic Old Testament that is complete, it actually has more books than the Hebrew version of the Old Testament. It's called the Mishnah Tanakh. It's compiled in Babylon about 50 BC by Aramaic Jews who later would write the Talmud. It's kind of ironic that these Jews who were instrumental in banning the name have left behind some great evidence as to how to say it, inadvertently. Because if the name was Yehovah, or, Yah, or, or, or these other names, they would not have shortened it to Yah. That doesn't make sense. In the Peshetta Tanakh, nearly 7,000 places with the name of Yahweh, yod heh wah appears in Hebrew. It's replaced with mar -Yah, Master Yah. And when you hear Yahu, that means Yah is. So when you take out the is, what you are left with is Yah. Hallelujah. And if you look in the, in the in throughout the Tanakh, the name Yahu is preserved in countless names. Yesha Yahu, Nehem Yahu, Yerim Yahu, Eli Yahu, not Yeho. Ever. The same use of Maria is in the Aramaic text of the Gospels. And the Apostles, in their native Aramaic dialect, and let's not make any mistake, the Apostles, they may have known some Greek, but that was not their first language. You can read in Acts 1 verse 19 that they call the place where Judas the betrayer died the field of blood, and the name of the field of blood was Achel Doma, which, they, which is Aramaic, not Hebrew. And it says, and that was the language of the city. What city? Jerusalem. So it should be no surprise that the apostles, who were native Aramaic speakers, who were Jews who spoke Aramaic, would also write down the most important thing they ever found in their lives, the Messiah, guess what they're going to write in? Aramaic. And so when they quote the Old Testament, the first covenant writings, they use Maria 7,000 times where it said Yahweh. That's how we know there's no mistake here. And as for Yeshua himself, another famous native Aramaic speaker, I think we will agree Yeshua is pretty famous. He says Maria, which is what got him in trouble, because if he was speaking Hebrew, he would have said Yahweh, but he says Maria many, many times. Those are just, just the sampling of scriptures. That's just what I got off the top of my head. And finally, it's important to point out that Aramaic will spell Yah either as Y-A or Yod Aleph in Babylon for the Peshera Tanakh or Yod He in the Egyptian Aramaic documents. And again, because we saw the ancient vowels, 
we know that's Yah. They found in Egypt 39 Jewish names. Every single one of them said Yah or Yahoo. Never Yeho. Not once does Yeho come up. Might be a clue. So up next, we're going to look at grammar and vowels for a little bit. And then we're going to take a break. This is what Josephus says. He's an eyewitness to the name. He goes, a turban also of fine linen surrounded his head, meaning the high priest, which was tied by a blue ribbon, about which there was another golden crown, in which was engraved the sacred name of God. It consists of four vowels. This is huge. This is about a Hebrew name being explained by a native Hebrew person. So what Josephus is saying that the name in Hebrew and in Greek consisted of four vowels. The Greek version is simply copying the sounds that they heard from the Hebrew. I think that kind of makes sense. So we have to look at Hebrew grammar to determine what the name can be. And there are winners and losers in this when we look at the grammar. I'm going to try to keep this as short and non-technical as I possibly can. Quoting from a very respected Hebrew linguist, he says, However, long before the introduction of vowel signs, it was felt that the main vowel sound should be indicated in writing. So the three letters, Yod, Y, H, or He, and O, were used to represent long vowels. I want you all to say this with me. Long vowels. This is big. Jacob Wine, read practical grammar for classical Hebrew. Long vowels in Hebrew for these letters are E, A, U, and A. You can see where I'm going. Y, H, W, H. The H is silent because Yahweh. Right there. But in case you're wondering why the H is silent, it's because there's another rule. Got to do the grammar a little bit here. The letter H, or H, can never be a vowel in the middle of a word. Never. Where is that in the word Yehovah? It's kind of in the middle, isn't it? The H is stronger and firmer than the Aleph or the A. The H never loses its consonantal sound in the middle of a word. So says Wilhelm Cassinius, one of the greatest Hebrew grammar experts who's ever walked the face of the earth. You go into your Strong's Concordance, you look, look up the grammar in your Bible software like Logos, they quote just Cassinius all over the place because he's practically unmatched in what he does. And in another related matter, the same Hebrew letter cannot exist as an O and a consonant at the same time. Why? Because it is marked if it is a vowel or a consonant. You can't mark and unmark a letter at the same time. Right? That's why we have vowel markings in Hebrew in the first place. And there's another source that gets into a lot of detail about how that works. Again, trying to keep it easy. These rules not only support the name being Yahweh, they eliminate the possibility of Yehovah as well. <laughs> hey, I, I, I gave you the heads up. You gotta give me that, right? Okay. 
I knew it would be tough. Okay. Since the H cannot be a vowel in the middle of a word, the next letter, the vav or the wa, has to do double duty as a vowel and a consonant. So if you want to say yehuva, you got to go ye, and then the wa or the vav has to be both o and v, o va. There's no other way to do it except for one teensy weensy little problem. It's impossible. <laughs> Every grammar agrees. Just saying. We'll be returning to more reasons against Yehovah a bit later. That's why I tried to give you notice. Next up, we need to look at another ancient Aramaic source. It's called Targamakalos. And this will probably be the last thing I do for part one, so that some of you can heal a little, perhaps. <laughs> According to Jewish tradition, Targumakalos, which is an Aramaic interpretation of the Hebrew Torah, there were three complete Aramaic interpretations, which is not the same as a translation, that survived. And of these three, Targa Angelos is the oldest and the most important. It goes back to the first century or maybe straight up to about the middle of the second century, but somewhere in there. So this is very ancient. The surviving manuscripts of Angelos, even lacking vowels, tell us a remarkable story about the ban on the name. Because remember, the vowels don't come about until the Middle Ages. But we can still find out what Ankylos thought about the name. Actually, they thought they were still hiding it. And then they sort of realized a couple of centuries down the road, oops. So let me show you how, you, how this works. This is a transliteration done by a good friend and colleague of mine, Ewan McLeod, called My Targum Ankylos. And this is the Aramaic version of Genesis 1, verse 1. Instead of saying Bereshit, it says Bekat bin bara Yahweh. See that? Because it puts the name of the, of the Father as Y-W-Y. Can you get Yehovah from Y-W-Y? No. Okay. Now, this is a dude named Alexander Sperber, who is one of two men who collected a lot of manuscripts of Ankylos to make what we scholars call a critical edition. That's basically fancy scholar talk for lining up a bunch of manuscript witnesses, figuring out what the majority readings are, and coming out with a final reading while you footnote the differences. He said in his work, the Bible in Aramaic, volume one, page 15, the divine name in this version is Y-W-Y. -Y. This is the image of the actual manuscript of old manuscript of Ankylos that shows how they changed it. Because somewhere around the 11th century, they're going, ah, that's a little close. We gotta do something. So we're going to attack the middle letter and change it from a Y Y change it to Y Y Y. As in Y Y Y did we get so close to revealing the name when we didn't want to? Then even the triple Y was not good enough. So when Jewish prayer books came out in the late Middle Ages and into the modern times, they decided that, that one of those Y's had to go. So now, you see a double Y. Yeah, we don't want that witness talking because we cut his bottom half off because he originally was a W, Yahweh. And notice this, there is Yah, as the name of, of the Lord, right there, not banned. So they attack this form of the name 
but they keep the short form because the short form was not under the pen. But whether we're talking about the Aramaic Old Testament or this interpretation called Ankylos, Aramaic proves the right form of the name. And we will resume this discussion with the name preserved in Greek, another language that's ancient and also has vowels. We'll resume that in part two. Meanwhile, thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs>